Hello everyone, welcome back to Moffett Field. Welcome to 2020. It's February 2020. The holidays are over. New Year's is gone. Valentine's Day just finished. So here I am back at it. Uh, my brother and I have just picked up a new game called Crusade and Revolution. We've been playing War Room by Larry Harris recently. And over the holidays we played a couple other games too. We picked, we played some uh, Mare Nostrum, Friedrich, Little Conquest of the Empire, and I uh, actually picked this up too, World at War. Looks like a beast, but I had to buy it and see what it looks like. But, like I said, we're here to look at Crusade and Revolution, the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939. Yes, uh, it was published in 2013, so I'm a little behind the curve, about nine years. And it's based on Paths of Glory, which is a huge hit. Um, I don't know when that was published, but I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that game. This is based on that gaming system with the card-driven game, I guess, but it also includes some dice. Um, yeah, so I'm not exactly on top of every game that's out there and actually my brother and I you know we used to play as kids Risk, Axis and Allies you name it we played back then Fortress America all those games Supremacy and we just started a couple of years ago getting back into it maybe three or four years now uh, with Axis and Allies and so we played of course Global 40 now for probably four years and we've I customize that game and we go down to Sire Blood's tournament and uh, we, we love it, but just trying to branch out a little bit. Like I said, playing some new things like War Room. Um, but saw this Spanish Civil War game. There aren't that many out there. We've played the GMT game before and I'll touch on that a little bit as well. You may have seen my other videos on that. Um, but here we are. Again, Crusade and Revolution. On Board Game Geek, it ranks pretty high. It's number 63. Don't know if you can see that. Number 63 in terms of War Games itself, which is pretty significant. I think Paths of Glory is number one or two, with 8,000 owners, according to Board Game Geek. This has around 700 to 800 owners. Uh, the weight is 3.2. I have not played Paths of Glory, but if you have, then probably it's 3.2. From looking at the rules of Paths of Glory and this game, uh, Crusade and Revolution seems to be a little deeper and more in depth. The rule book is about 80 pages with the playbook as well. And I think Paths of Glory is about half that. The print is also significantly tinier in this book, um, the fonts are much smaller, so there's a lot more packed into these 80 pages as well. But it's a good rule book. I'll go over that later too. If you're new to this gaming system like I am, Paths of Glory, it's probably a little higher up for the first 10 games or something. Um, what else? 180 to 360, that's probably not generous enough. I think it takes longer to play this game if one were to play it to the full 18 turns. We're on about game six or seven. The game we played last night, which I'll go over a little bit, uh, got us to game 10, turn 10. It took us four or five hours. We were still going through the rule book and things like that. But uh, 8.5 in terms of rankings or ratings. I got to tell you, it's a great game. I ranked it like 8. Maybe I'll bump it to 9 even. So that's a little summary of that. Uh, let's see, where do I want to start? How about... Um, yeah, the gameplay itself, like I said, it's Paths of Glory. So it's based on um, uh, a deck of hands. It's seven or eight that the players have that they swap out as they play them. You know, we've played other card games like Academy of Games 1775. The Spanish Civil War by GMT has chits. I actually created these cards to make the because the chits aren't that great. Uh, so it kind of has a card feel, but I wouldn't say it's card-driven. 
Um, you know, Mary Nostrum has cards. A lot of these games have cards, but not in this Paths of Glory system. So that makes the game interesting and fun and varied. The way the game system works here is that um, there's 18 turns. And the first six is one phase of the game. Uh, 7 through 12 is the War. Uh, so the, uh, 1 through 6 is called War of the Columns. And there's a certain card deck for that. Then there's the mobilization phase, 7 through 12, different cards. And then 13 through 18, War of the Armies, which we have not gotten to yet because we haven't passed turn 10. So here's an example of the cards, War of the Columns, Mobilization, War of the Armies. And they have different, uh, different events that happened historically. Communist interference, of course, Franco sending over the African units from North Africa, Soviet intervention, submarines. So there's a lot of historical context in the cards themselves, which is pretty interesting and makes the game uh, fun. Um, supply is key in this game. As I've been reading about Paths of Glory, you don't want to be out of supply. Otherwise, you will lose the game, which happened in this uh like I said, game number seven or so that we've played. It looked like Franco was definitely going to win this time. And what we're looking here is the aftermath. So what happened was started out pretty equal. The Republicans were, were advancing um, into the south and holding the south, southern region of Spain. The Nationalists were able to take the Basque region up here and it was pretty quiet over near Barcelona. There wasn't a lot of movement or anything happening there. I would say most of the action was in the south, probably as it typically is. And the Nationalists had gotten close to taking Madrid, which is obviously an important city. And then they got cut, their supply line got cut and they lost like three cores. And cores are the big, t uh, the big units here, the powerful ones. And uh, they got cut off and lost and that halted their advance to Madrid. Then they were still sitting pretty good. The Nationalists were still looking good. And then, kind of a spoiler, they just, uh, my brother just miscalculated and left all his supply lines vulnerable. So this T-26 tank was able to come down here and snatch this supply source, putting a lot of the south out of supply. Uh, then he left this supply line open from the north. So this uh, fourth core moved in and closed that supply line. And then the last supply area, Sevilla, was pretty much encircled and it was probably only a matter of time. But the Nationalists, this was the closest game the Nationalists had come. Uh, if you hadn't uh, uh, messed up on the supply here, I'd play 60-40, 70-30, the Nationalists would have won this time. It's tough. We've been finding in both the Spanish Civil War by GMT and this game, um, maybe we haven't played it enough, but the Nationalists definitely have the the burden here to win the Republicans, you know, they, they're pretty strong and it's pretty hard to, to break through to Madrid and some of these cities and get the victory points and morale. And, and I'll just touch on that. This game is morale based Republican morale and nationalist victory point based. So, uh, similar to the GMT game, different events, taking cities, reduce Republican morale, increase, victory points for the uh, nationalists and there's certain criteria here to win. There's automatic victory at certain points uh, depending on the ratio of these to each other. This is the uh, this is the replacement track and you also track things on here like siege, um, axis replacement points, Soviet replacement points so that's what this is used for. 
this is Mallorca. It's an island off of the coast of Spain that can be captured through amphibious landing. Of course, the turn tracker. Here's the eliminated units. Here's the reserve units. This is an interesting mechanism. I haven't seen this before. I think it's Paz of Glory based as well. But you have uh, each turn, each of these 18 turns has six phases. So you keep track. The Nationalist goes first, takes a phase. Then the Republicans play a phase and there's six phases. And you can play a certain uh, variety of things you can do in that in your turn in the six phases. You can move. There's unlimited movement, except in winter. It's limited. Uh, you can do nothing and move one unit. One, you can activate one space. You activate spaces and you can move as many units that are in that space as you want. You can also build trenches and positions with them. And there's reinforcements and replacement up here. So that's kind of how you keep track of the turns and what um, what's taking place in the turns. So it's very interesting, very dynamic game. Tons of stuff to keep track of. Uh, what else here? Um, in terms of the map, the map is pretty good overall. All the spaces are called out well. These dotted lines are rivers. So when you attack across a river, you get shifts in in your uh, columns on the odds column. There's straight roads. There's mountain hexes. These little mountain symbols that you get minus die rolls for those. Uh, there's different cities. You know, if it's a named city like Sevilla, it has a bigger impact if it gets captured. This little circle is the supply indicator. So that's nationalist supply. There's special supply zones. Uh, like in most Spanish Civil War games, supply is important. And uh, the north starts out of supply until the north and south are joined. Then restrictions are removed on the north. The Republicans also have restrictions in the north, in the northern frontier. They're kind of isolated up there as well in the Basques and Setanders. They can't move. The Catalonians have less of a restriction over here. So that's kind of the map. Um, if I had some criticisms on the map, I wish it was more detailed. I wish the there was more background to the map. Like I, I wish the rivers were clearer and the borders were clearer um, and the mountain zones were clearer because this brown just kind of washes out and there's not you don't learn a lot of the geography of Spain from this map, which is kind of the fun of playing games is you learn geography a little bit. So it's it's a little bit lacking. For example, if I compare it to uh, the Spanish Civil War by GMT, this is their map, right? It's a lot more detailed. The rivers are clear. Um, the mountains are clear. Plains. So I kind of wish it was this GMT background on the Crusade and Revolution map. Not a huge deal, but... Again, it's kind of this whole map kind of washes out, and it might make it easier to see these river lines and things like that if there was a river underneath those. Uh, what else? But the map is has excellent uh, features on it. It has a pretty good terrain. Let me get the camera over here. It has a pretty good terrain thing. I wish this had like the combat modifiers on it on the terrain. I wish that was a little more detailed. This, uh, this section is for victory points for capturing Madrid. If the Nationalists take Madrid or don't, there's certain um, penalties. There's some other things up here like ammo. Here's the, tracking the ammo shortage for the Nationalists. The, the Republicans have their game tracking area, their reserves. Um, like I said, the capital cities, what else? There's lots of notes on the map, which are good. So you can see it tells you, gives you hints, national victory if this. Uh, it gives you notes here for morale. On the turn tracker, it gives little hints. Like in turn one, you get die roll modifiers until you're out of that. It shows the victory points required on the map. So love that kind of stuff. Love these, these hints and notes that are on the map that keep you from having to go back to the rule book all the time which is very helpful. Uh, the cards too have lots of 
um, information and hints and references. They could put a little more like uh, where to look in the book for these cards, if it referenced page numbers, something like that on the cards. So if, it, if you have a question, you could flip to that. That wouldn't be too hard to add to these cards. Uh, let's see, I think that covers it. The pink and blue, yeah, whatever. It's maybe not the most uh, traditional choice, but it works. I guess they're into pastels. And the other thing I would say is if this if this turn tracker up here was separated, because everything's tracked on this, so it would be nice if there was a separate turn tracker for the replacement points and for the victory points and for the morale. Gets a little crowded when there's things going on up there. Okay. I think that's it for the map. I might have a couple things later. But uh, it's, oh, it's mounted on cardboard, which is nice. I think the first version maybe was paper. But this version has, uh, is mounted on a good cardboard in two pieces, two sections. Uh, how about the units? The units themselves, the cardboard, you know, from, from what I have read and know, the Spanish Civil War, there was just a ton of different countries and people showing up to fight. There were, of course, the, there were the Republicans and the Nationalists. Um, there were the Germans, the Italians, the Soviets, the French played a little bit in supply maybe, the Portuguese, the British had to decide what to do. There were the international brigades on the Republican side that had Americans, that had Russians, Germans even, anti-fascists. They had there were about 100 Chinese I read that came over from China that fought. Um, so kind of everybody showed up to the party. And this represents it pretty well. It's not quite as detailed as the Spanish Civil War by GMT. They really go into depth in terms of the units and the size. And so if you want more of a historic, truly historical representation, Spanish Civil War might be better. That game fails in a major way, though, because of the supply, keeping track of supply, which is a problem. Um, this game's a little more lenient, I think, in that sense. Even though supply is critical in this game too, it's easier to keep track of. But back to the units. So here's some example of the units. Let me switch to... So here we have the Basque units. Uh, we have the uh, Catalunians. Here's a T-26 Russian tank. Here's the International Brigade that comes in. And here's a core-sized unit. So it's kind of nice that they make the counter bigger. So the more powerful cores are a bigger, sorry, moving the camera around, or a bigger counter, which is nice. On the Republican side, there's the um, militia. Both sides have militia, which is in the first six turns, the militia are pretty much placeholders until people get organized, until the Republicans get everybody together, until Franco gets his armies together. Then these bigger cores show up. So the first six turns, it's pretty much militia, some police, some cavalry, you know, that you're trying to grab as much territory maybe and uh, fill stop gaps until, in a way, until the real war begins after turn six. Um, so there's, uh, so on the uh, nationalists, they have, again, militia, Italians, police, cavalry. Here's the African units from North Africa that were the highly trained at the beginning that probably... Uh, clinched the war for Franco because it allowed him to advance early on. They flew those guys over and they had been fighting for years in North Africa in the Rift Wars, I think. Uh, Panzer I, basically a machine gun on a on a track and these little CB-33, the little uh, Italian tanks are represented. So it has a pretty good representation of the units involved in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, a couple other things at the beginning of the game, some of the space, uh, what is it, Granada, and there's a space up north in the northern frontier that's isolated, but they're isolated. It's like being kind of out of supply, not quite fully out of supply. There's other things in the game here too, like positions and trenches, that uh, if you're 
if you don't move or if you activate a space but don't move somebody you can try to build a position once you build the position you can build a trench and these all shift the column on the odds the game starts off with sieges there's three different sieges that are taking place if the nationalists liberate those towns they get extra points uh, or in fact morale morale and victory point these are all customizations I did the out of box stuff's not bad the trenches and stuff but I kind of like it's easier to see when they're higher on the board so you know if you put it if there's a, a trench here and you got a guy on top of it it's just it's a little easier to see than just the out of box counter but these are good they're not they're not bad um, a couple more examples of the things that happen in the game beachhead landings severe winners winters that's uh, so that's kind of the units that come with it high quality the cards are nice of course pretty easy to make nice cards but those it all adds up into a quality game and what else here oh yeah so one of the things that doesn't represent that well and I think that the GMT game does this better excuse me is the air war so in this game there's no dedicated air counters there's they are they have it for the armor as I showed um, and instead what they do is they have air cards you can play so you can bring these into a fight these are combat cards and you can pull these in and they modify die rolls so it it's okay it represents it but if you take a look at um, the GMT game they actually have You know the Condor Legion and they have Soviets and uh, another thing too they have like naval bombardment so none of these games really represent the naval aspect of the civil Spanish Civil War it wasn't that important probably overall I mean it was important but it wasn't that significant in terms of the number of ships and things it was important for supply keeping things supplied and having uh, access to ports but there there weren't that many big naval battles so I think it's okay the way they represent the naval battles with the cards, but the air war was more significant and maybe it doesn't work with Paths of Glory games to have airplane counters on the board. I don't know, but um, just point out, I think it would be more fun if you could call in counters and they get damaged and if the planes were at risk of being shot down, things like that versus the card system again maybe it doesn't work but if there was going to be a future version maybe they could think about adding some actual airplane units don't know how they would fly around the board though okay so i think that covers the map and the units uh the rule book is well done it's clear there's a table of contents of course which is nice introductions it's well laid out the sections make sense and they give examples of stuff the graphics are great it's it's um there's a lot of nuances to this game and i would say little rules and exceptions that can be challenging you know when to do something what card has been played um, downsizing a core when it gets destroyed to a division uh, winter how many times you can play a certain action uh, so there's a lot of nuances and asymmetric too like the Republicans have different rules in turn one viral modifiers so it, it can be complicated but it's not overwhelmingly uh, game ending if you miss something so often you we just honestly we can't keep track of every rule all the time so sometimes we'll forget to replace a division or put a division when a core gets destroyed but usually it's we catch it pretty quickly and we're like you know what just put a division there or it would have retreated here and we you know get get rid of the get rid of it and bring in a bringing a division here or something like that right so it wouldn't it's not it doesn't seem like it it changes the game that much or um, if you misread a card 
maybe and you bring in one extra unit or whatever, you move incorrectly on a strategic move, they're not going to destroy the game. You can over, you know, you can get beyond those little errors. Um, however, like in a game like Cataclysm, at least we found, Cataclysm has so many little rules that are so important that if you miss one, three turns later, you could be like, oh, we need to stop the game because that would have totally changed it and now it's not even fun playing anymore. And there's no way to keep track of all those rules. But this game, it's pretty good in, in, in providing and being able to find things and remember them. And thankfully, they included an index, which many rule books lack these days. Um, don't know why. It's not that hard. They probably don't have a word, and they can do it pretty quickly. This one could be a little more in-depth. There's still some things missing. This could probably be a two-page index, but it's good. Uh, if they re do another reprint, maybe they can beef up the index a little bit. There's a lot of optional rules one can play with. There's a lot of uh, historical context. That they, these are all historical notes they talk about in relation to the cards and the war itself, which is very cool. So a good rule book overall. Um, what else? I was just trying to think what makes a game fun and playable. And first of all, it has to be engaging and it has to move along. It has to, you know, not get bogged down. It has to be fun. That, that makes it fun. It's fun that there's, that there are these special situations that each side isn't exactly the same. So that makes it, um, variable. And these card system, I gotta say, like I said, the first time playing Paths of Glory, people are gonna be like, of course, Steve, we've been playing Paths of Glory for 20 years, it's great. Well, new to us, the card system, just a lot of fun. You can play these cards in different ways. One can use them to move, one can use the strategic move here, like three movements. One can play the actual card as it's read, as you read on the card, or you can use it to bring in uh, re uh, replacement points to buy replacement points for damaged units so just a lot to do here you can attack and you can move um, when you activate a space like I said before you can build a trench or a position so we've played six or seven games so far none of them have been similar there's always been a different twist there's always been uh, the north something going on in the north or it's quiet or one game the Republicans pushed in in Catalonia. So, you know, there's things we haven't even tried yet. We tried one game where the Mallorca was taken. Um, I know there's a card on the Republicans for an amphibious landing. There's a few times I wish I had that card because I wanted to land, you know, elsewhere. There's the Straits of Gibraltar. So every game is, it just feels like you could play this a thousand times and every game would be different. Uh, the cards might start to get a little stale. But um, I think there's enough of them and the variety and when you would get them that, that they'll continue to be fun. There might even be some house rule cards for this game on Board Game Geek. I haven't checked. Um, I think unlike Axis and Allies where you can house rule a ton of stuff, I think if you house rule in this game, you're probably going to break it. But there might be some tweaks to make that uh, would make the game seem fresh. Um, the three different phases to the game, like I said before, the War of the Columns, the Mobilization Phase, the War of the Armies. It's almost, it seems like it's going to be three games in one. At the beginning, you're struggling to keep your militia going and, and attack. The Republicans have restrictions on how they can attack. And, uh, the map itself, it's almost a hex game in a way, this map, um, because some of these things have five, six connections to them. So it's kind of a pseudo hybrid map, hex map. And I think I read in the directions that they tried different versions. It might have been Paths of Glory. They tried different versions. They tried it as a hex game. They tried it as an area control and it ended up with this point to point system, which works well. And if you put these into hexes, it would almost be a hex, a hex game anyway. So the map, you know, it's a playable map. That makes it fun and uh, and keeps the game moving. Um, of course, you learn things. You learn the history. You learn about how the different uh, 
factions interfered or helped or what the impact was of the Italians coming in and the Germans with their strong units of the Soviets. Uh, you learn about a little bit about the geography of Spain. And I guess overall, it's just a fun game. Okay, I'll do a final conclusion here, but here's the map set up for our campaign game. I thought I'd give you a quick shot of this so you can see what it looks like um, fresh out of the gate in 1936. As you can see, there's no cores on the board yet. Those come in turn six. Here's the frontier with Oviedo under siege. Uh, Catalonia area, Barcelona, Valencia, Here's uh, Madrid and Toledo. So Toledo, there was was pretty much bombed into uh, submission, and what you see there in Toledo today, up on the hill, the castle, I believe that was rebuilt after the Spanish Civil War because there wasn't much left. Uh, and then in the south here we have another siege. We have Sevilla, and so you kind of can kind of see the front line. Here's the isolated Granada, surrounded. So that's the campaign setup. Um, in conclusion, I guess overall though, there's at least these two games that we've played. Historical board gaming has a version as well. Honestly, I haven't even played it. The map looks okay, but the rules just don't go into the depth that these two games do. Spanish Civil War, extremely in depth, but has that supply issue that's hard to overcome. So if you're if, you want, if you're looking for a Spanish Civil War game, I think it's Crusade and Revolution by Compass Games. Uh, you get a bit of the flavor of history. It's not so tied down to the historical uh, events that it's not that much fun. You know, you can play around with this and, and try your own scenarios. And like I said earlier, it doesn't seem like the game will be the same game twice. So... Crusade and Revolution gets my vote. I'm sure we'll be playing this quite a bit. Probably in between some war room uh, battles as well. If you have any questions, please leave me questions, comments, suggestions. And I'll probably do, like I said, a video on the customizations that I did. Um, like these custom blocks here for the sieges, for the positions, etc. All right, uh, so until then, thanks for watching. Take care.